this shows a diagram of the way bird lungs work. Uh, the air goes into the air sacs and out through the lungs. Uh, it makes them far more efficient. And uh, they happen to have a very thin blood air barrier, which also helps in that regard. And as a consequence, they come into equilibrium with their environment far faster than we do. Uh, this was relied upon by coal miners, of course. You've heard the canary in the coal mine up until about 1986. And uh, so by that time, we finally got uh, instrumentation to detect gases. And so we didn't need the birds anymore. But methane was coming out of uh, coal deposits. Carbon monoxide was coming out of the engines in the mine. Either way, it was lethal. Today, uh, we have how birds in our homes. And now we have these monitors in the homes. And oftentimes, people that are in the know, they'll put them near the bird because the bird is so sensitive. Uh, and uh, in any case, uh, they are sometimes the first to go when there's a problem with the home, when there's a gas appliance or an engine that's working that shouldn't be. But they also are affected by other things like burning overheated Teflon coatings, that kind of thing, or sprays, or secondhand tobacco smoke. Birds die from these things. And so they do give us a, a bit of a warning. We're going to talk a little more about one toxicology, three different examples, insecticides, mercury, and flame retardants, and then a few wrap-up messages. So from my point of view, one toxicology hinges on actually protecting domestic and wild animals in the environment. If we did that well, could we worry less about toxic impacts in people? And here's an image of a thyroid adenoma in a cat. And there's been an article out there called Fireproof Killer Whales. Uh, it's, th th these animals are contaminated in some parts of the world. Um, but we forget about what's going on in the human area sometimes, sort of not here so much as there. And if you look at the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health recently published, you'll find that impacts on humans from contaminants uh, tend to exceed some of the major infectious diseases on the planet today. So if we were consistently protecting humans, which we are not, we might be consistently protecting more of the animals as well. We do have a lot that's conserved evolutionarily in terms of genomes. There are some differences and some differences in receptors and metabolism, physiology, certainly in diets and lifestyles. Um, but we think about where animals live and what their lifespans are. And small animals are oftentimes in the home. They tell us about the home in the yard and the air in the water. There was this incident in 2007 of, uh, of uh, melamine and cyanuric acid causing kidney failure. And you would have think that if this was in a people that were spiking a uh, protein supplement used for animal feed, you would think that would be enough to warn them. Uh, but nonetheless, they turned right around and put it into baby formula a year later, and thousands of children in China were hospitalized with kidney failure, and several, several of them died. Um, farm animals, uh, we know where they've been. Uh, we have a pretty good idea about what they've been eating. They're killed and inspected relatively early. So if something's obvious, it may be caught. And the breeding animals are killed when they start to slow down on reproduction, and similar examinations take place. Game animals. Hunters and fishers, they look at these animals, and sometimes they will pick up something that's out of the ordinary. And wildlife veterinarians will look at them as well. These animals live in different environments. They have different lifespans, some for you know, five to six months, some for 200 years, like bowhead uh, whales. Uh, so we know about some of them, where they've been. We know others integrate over thousands of miles. And this gives us insights if we compartmentalize these things. As, to what's happening. We look at an earthworm or a daphnia, or we could look at a uh, Swainson's hawk. So we do have to examine them clinically when we can. It's not so easy for some species. And uh, look at them post-mortem as well. And you'll hear about that uh, from Daniel Martineau coming up. We also need to look at what they eat, what their water is, and the soils. And then oftentimes we have to turn around and do some research for confirmation. That research might be with field animals. Oftentimes it will be in, with laboratory animals, sometimes animals that are close surrogates, sometimes not so much. But one thing to keep in mind is that wild animals need to be in peak condition because they have some serious assignments. And they aren't washing every night. There's nobody cooking their food for them. Um, they need to avoid becoming prey. They need to compete. They have to strut just right and send all the right body language. They have to breed successfully. They have to care for their young. Um, they have to survive the weather. 
So let's talk a bit about some metals for a moment. And we'll start with mercury. Mercury is a bit unique. It's a volatile metal. It travels around the earth. Um, it gets down into sediments where bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, convert it into methyl mercury. And then it moves up the food chain. And uh, it's a serious threat to animals and people alike. It's in the muscle of fish. And it crosses into the central nervous system and readily crosses into the developing young as well. The classic case is Minamata, Japan. In that instance, uh, they actually changed the catalyst and they started producing methylmercury directly and releasing it into the bay. Soon, dead fish were floating and the fishermen complaining they couldn't catch anything. Within a couple of years, the birds were crashing into the sea. Then the cats started seizuring about that same time and they fell off the bay, off the pier and drowned in the bay sometimes. A few years later, they started having severe neurotoxic problems in the children that were eating the fish. And then they reproduced the syndrome in the cats. But they didn't stop releasing the pollutant for about 11 years. And it took a long time for them to count up the dead, about 1,800 people. And then it took a long time for them to settle with some of the others that weren't so obviously uh, poisoned. And this has been the way it's, it, it, it often works. Industry denies it, blames other people, blames infectious diseases. This is the way it went in Minamata Bay. There's still people affected with that. So mercury is globally important still, and there are hot spots that are important. This is just a recent thing on a discussion group that I'm a part of. Uh, it's an incident where a dog got mercury poisoning in Australia. And I'm not sure the disposition of this dog, except it had all the hallmarks of neurologic signs of mercury poisoning. And it had an analyses uh, of mercury in its hair and in its blood that were consistent with poisoning. And they did a really good workup with MRI and CT and CSFs and vitamin analyses. And they didn't find any other cause. So they're con comfortable that mercury is the problem. This was coming from fish that was intended for human consumption. The people were eating the fish and they were giving it to their dog. They were trying to get the benefits of omega-3s, which is important, uh, and, and protein, which is essential. Uh, but they put their animal at risk, and we don't know the story on their family at this time. So mercury comes from a lot of places, and it used to be that we worried most about coal-fired power plants, and they're still important. But this indicates that recently it's been that, that source of Airborne mercury was, has been overtaken by that used to capture gold in small-scale operations around the world. Uh, you'll see other major sources here, primary metal production, large-scale gold production is still an issue, cement production. And, but technologies have been moving along, and, and there is reason to be hopeful that mercury will come down and is coming down in some places. This just shows you what's coming out of Asia still. And this map gives you an idea about what the hot spots are. And you can see we still contribute, as does Eastern Europe, but especially Asia. Um, we do have fish advisories here, and uh, statewide for freshwater fish and coastal advisories as well. Uh, there's a reason for that. We're not so far below the limit. At mercury concentrations in American women have been going down, but they're not. We, not negligible at this point. There are still some people that are in ranges that are uh, impacted. The studies in animals, this is a surrogate. Zebra finch is a good animal model for behavior in birds. And they have fed mercury to birds. And they got some pretty whopping concentrations in their blood, much higher than they've been concerned about in people. And they showed all these neurologic signs, not eating so much, losing weight, hyperactivity, impaired spatial and, uh, he and hearing prop, uh, senses, uh, lower social hierarchy, hypersensitivity, delayed immunity, and liver damage. This is one of the, my friends, Marilyn Spaulding from the University of Florida. She's done some really nice work with great egrets showing that uh, they picked up mercury in the Everglades from emissions coming out of medical incinerators. And in those days, in the 80s, they were using a lot of mercury in the hospitals and they were burning the waste. And it was going down, coming down the Everglades and it was coming back to the birds and the fish. So the great egrets were especially impacted. And they turned around and did a study with concentrations similar to what was in the fish. And they wound up seeing that the birds ate less and grew more slowly and that most of the high birds, high dose birds died. They had a lot in their feathers. This is an excretory route, just as it is in people. We see mercury in hair. There's also a lot in the blood and in the brain and in the liver. Now those concentrations are coming down because those emissions are not there because the Everglades does sort of wash 
itself clean. There was also an issue of uh, species of birds, ibis, that tend to eat a lot more crustaceans, so a bit lower on the food chain. But they too have had problems. They did a study with them feeding them methylmercury at concentrations found in the wild. And they got 13% uh, of the nests fed mercury at any level, had no offspring at the high dose, 35% fewer managed to get through fledgling. They were endocrine disrupted. They had low testosterone. They had male to male pairings at a really high rate. Uh, and again, they had pretty high levels of mercury in those birds. In the Arctic, it's a different story, uh, an ongoing story. Uh, the feathers of this gull uh, species have increased in mercury about 50 fold over about 130 years. Uh, the gull populations have decreased 80%. We're not sure where, what the causes are, but mercury may be a contributing factor, and mercury pollution is expected to increase in high latitudes. And what's happening in part is this. Uh, there's been a recent study out just in February that showed that mercury is coming out of permafrost. And that permafrost is just absolutely loaded with it. And that this could increase the global burden of mercury significantly. So we're going to have to watch for that. And it's another reason not to tolerate such extreme ignorance about the causes of global warming. The Fish and Wildlife Service has said that fish, uh, that the diets of, of birds should not exceed 0.1 parts per million. This, this, these couple of uh, graphics here show you that what's allowed for humans, what's considered safe for humans is 0.3 parts per million. And so there are fish that are above that. But if you look to the, on the bar to the left, you'll see 0.1. And you'll see that just all kinds of fish are over the line. Uh, so for animals, I am concerned that we're not looking for the subclinical effects of, of mercury. Um, so mercury, yes, in some parts of the world, we've done pretty well in getting the concentrations down. It's being phased out here and there. It's being eliminated. Um, but the artisanal gold is, a, is an issue, and the coal-fired power plants are an issue. So we have the incentives really not there yet. Uh, we could stop buying electricity and goods from producers that foul the world with mercury. We need the labeling. Uh, we need the logos. We need to avoid the greenwashing. We do have the Minamata Convention on Mercury, which has all kinds of recommendations in it. It is a treaty. We have signed it. Um, I don't know what would happen these days, but it was signed. And uh, we, there's good sponsorship from the part of the, universe, uh, of the United States in terms of trying to lower global mercury concentrations. We need transparency. We need outreach. We need all sectors. We need to stop mining mercury. There's uh, a lot to be gained. This just shows you something that happened that's kind of a positive story in Finland. Uh, they had cementer workers, and they had nasal and lung and stomach cancers. But if you looked at the environment, you found that the birds were hammered long before the people. They had direct toxic toxicity, they had reduced food availability. But they got a 99% decrease in the emissions of the metals. And over time, the birds' health and the bird numbers are coming back. So we should go back and touch on insecticides a bit and mention Silent Spring and Rachel Carson. And again, she was demeaned because she was, had published Silent Spring because of all of the associations she made with uh, health and contamination issues. Um, but she started the environmental movement. And she really was behind what came later in the environmental laws that protect us. Insecticides, DDT, right? It's neurotoxic, it inhibits calcification of eggshells, it's estrogenic, and we have concerns about anti-androgenicity, and especially the top feeding birds in long food chains, the ospreys. And so we know pretty much about how this works, and these neutral molecules accumulate in the uh, fat, and uh, they're not readily eliminated, and they go into the firstborn offspring through the milk, uh, especially. Uh, but there was this problem of eggshells and birds lost and all that. But things got better when DDT was taken off the market and other organochlorines soon after that. And the birds' numbers have come back. They're doing pretty well, including in Pennsylvania. With the introductions, but also with breeding in the wild. So now we have them pretty much all over the place. So things can get better. But we can be backsliding as well. With uh, birds, you have to remember, they have such high metabolic rates. They have to eat a lot, a lot of surface area, a lot of heat loss. They have to eat a lot. And when they are poisoned with an insecticide that's neurotoxic, they can't do it. They won't do it. 
uh, when they don't have anything to eat, they, they don't have anything to eat. When the organisms in their food web are decimated by the pesticide, that's an issue. And they get stressed and they have corticosterone. So they get immunosuppressed. So now we have fipronil and we have the neonicotinoids. Fipronil, not so biomagnified, it's neurotoxic, lethal poisoning from eating the pretreated seeds. Sublethal poisoning from eating the lesser amounts of the seeds and toxicity to their food web. So it's an issue. We need more studies on the predatory birds as well. The neonicotinoids, things are similar. They don't biomagnify, but there is problem when their birds are sprayed and when they eat the seeds, they just get decimated. In November of 2016, uh, hundreds of blackbirds died in southern New Jersey from eating treated wheat seed. So the birds crash. They, at lower doses, they have genotoxicity, reduced immunity, impaired reproduction, not enough to eat. In a part of the Netherlands, the bird populations that were eating insects were declining at 3.5%, and the area is treated with imidacloprid and neonicotinoid. So protecting the bees might help, certainly will help, most likely. Bees are being hammered in many ways, immunosuppression, direct toxicity, disorientation, all of that. And different governments, including the US, have restricted these insecticides, but the neonicotinoids are being reviewed under the current EPA administrator, so we'll have to see what happens. Other insecticides are around. Part of the problem is, what will they, we turn to if they're taken off the market? A lot of the other insecticides are neurotoxic and they may be worse than some of these neonicotinoids in terms of some of the other endpoints. We need integrated biodiversity management. Uh, to, get a, to minimize pesticide use and to maximize conservation of species that we need to help control the pest insects. So lastly, we'll touch on some halogenated organics. And we'll mention PCBs and flame retardant, PBDEs. These things have a lot of different effects. They're biomagnified, there's thyroid problems, reproductive problems, cancers, developmental and learning and behavioral problems, nephrotoxicity. In other words, the kidneys are harmed, the liver's harmed and skin problems. Now, things have gotten better in terms of uh, PCBs, but they're kind of flattened out in terms of concentrations in the Great Lakes. PBDEs, we have to remember the similarity of these chlorines and bromines and iodines. And different mixtures were used, the pennas and the octas, and then the fully brominated DECA as flame retardants. We had this issue of thyroid adenomas in the cats. I was a small animal doctor in practice until 1978. In 1979 came the first report of thyroid adenomas with hyperthyroidism in cats. And this is a common problem. I would bet there's several people in this room who've seen that in their family cat. In any case, uh, people finally started to ask, why did this happen? It, we didn't used to see this. And they looked at flame retardants and they found that there were residues of these flame retardants in the cats that were very high in this first study 20 to 100 fold those of US adults. The cats live in the house. They sleep on the padded furniture where the flame retardants are. They'll even sleep on the computer sometimes. Whatever's warm, right? They'll be there. And uh, one of my students, she did the biggest study on these, looking at 62 owned cats and 10 feral cats. The feral cats had the lowest PVDEs and the lowest thyroid hormone residues. They were probably physiologically normal. The indoor cats had problems with building up the flame retardants and having higher thyroid problems and thyroid uh, hormone concentrations. And the ones with the thyroid adenomas that were sick, they had the highest. In fact, one of these cats had 51 parts per million in the lipid, which is probably the highest that's ever been found. Others have looked at this as well. You'll see that in this small study from California, the PBDEs have gone down between 2008 and 2012. Uh, but they're still high. Compare that to the PCBs and the DDE residues in these animals. You can see the difference between the hyperthyroid and the non-hyperthyroid cats in terms of the residues. Others have found the same thing. Overall, house cats are sentinels for human exposures to these compounds and possibly for their thyroid disruption. It's difficult. You don't find funding readily for a 15-year-old long study in cats. Uh, we need to look at their in utero exposure and throughout their lives and to monitor them at the end. So they're in the outdoor environments. We have to think about that too. They don't readily photodegrade. They don't, they're slow to change. They have built up in Great Lakes fish. 
Um, they have plateaued and maybe started down a little bit in Great Lakes fish. Um, so here's where they are in the, some of the animals. These, some of these are lipid numbers as we had in the cats. And you can see that a lot of these top carnivores have quite a bit of these flame retardants in them. We don't have a really good idea about what their impacts are if they're having problems with thermal regulation or reproduction or brain development or capacity to learn or if they're susceptible to predators. Um, we don't know whether how good they're doing at hunting. We do know that things have been have happened in terms of voluntary cessations and withdrawals, including in the US market. Finally, no manufacture or import of decabrominated PBDE in the US. So we made some progress in terms of sources, but we have this issue of what's in our homes now. And we have damaged upholstery out there. We have old uh, uh, upholstery and, and, and carpet pads in people's homes. Well, what can we do about it? People have been, these are some of the recommendations. Put a mattress cover on, vacuum a lot, purchase new furniture if you can. But then people take the old padding out from under your carpet and what do they do with it? They, if you want them to recycle it. So they're handing it off to somebody else and it's going into their home. So we don't have a, a good way to get rid of these things that, that I know of. Maybe somebody else in this conference will say that we have a good way to you know, break it down. Burning it at a low temperature is not a good idea. So one toxicology is central to one health. Mercury is an important pollutant today, and it's probably going to get to be more pollutant, at least in some locales. DDT devastated birds, but current insecticides poison them in their food webs. Halogenated flame retardants, they're going to be with us for decades to come, and we'll see what happens with some of the replacement chemicals. We need more diagnoses. We need more careful usage and disposal. We certainly need more green chemistry. I'll take your questions. This is an important thing. These are some of my associates. I've done work with frogs. Tyrone may mention that. Uh, we've seen not just endocrine disruption, but we've seen altered infection rates as well because you change the food web. Uh, and you wind up favoring trematode infections, which cause all kinds of problems in the frogs. Also done work on, here's, this is not Dave Letterman. Um, <laughs> this guy was pretty smart. He talked about how things are common. Uh, different species diverge, you know. Daniel may talk about how marine mammals evolved from terrestrial animals. In any case, uh, I'll leave it with that and answer any of your questions now. Thank you. That was a, a great overview. I'm wondering if uh, the thyroid disease in the humans, we've been seeing also an uptick. And if you can relate to that, the exposures, not just to the cats as house, Pets, There's but. a lot of concern about that, and some folks have focused on it. I haven't gotten into that very much, but that is an area of concern. And it's not just uh, PBDs, it's PCBs and, and other things too. There are lots of different things. I'm sure you're going to hear more about that today. So, so one of the really important, thank, thank you for the beautiful lecture, uh, Bill. One of the really important things to note about that is that the takeoff in uh, flame retardants w w was caused by a regulation in California in the 1970s ca called Technical Bulletin 117. Um, and it came under the, the magnificent scrutiny of Arlene Blom, and her work basically got that removed from the books about a year or two ago. And so we're now looking to flame retardant free um, uh, household products such as. Uh, chairs and, and uh, couches and things becoming available. Um, you couldn't buy them in California, you could buy them here, but with the massive influx of Chinese uh, products that are formulated for California, what was happening is these are going up in people all across, across the country, with California being the really high one. So it's, get, it's gonna get better. Yeah, in California, they actually started offering PBDE free furniture before the rest of the country did. And at one point, you, I, I bought a couch and paid a lot extra for it to get a PBD for you instead of one that was made with the stuff from China that still had the PBDs in it. So, but now they're not in the new stuff, to my knowledge, but there will be other flame retardants, so we'll hopefully hear about that. That's, that's 
correct. Um, sl uh, there's uh, the natural sleep shop. I I'm, maybe shouldn't give an ad, but I will. The natural sleep shop up in Cranberry is a place where you can go and buy a bed uh, where the, the material for the bed has none of these chemicals in. If you're a young person of reproductive age, I always tell them, get, these, get away from these uh, products. And vacuum your house a lot, because the babies are the, right behind the cats. They have much higher concentration of these flame retardants than the adults do. And it's not just from mommy's milk. A lot of it is from the house dust. They're out there crawling around, and they're not licking themselves like the cats, but they're putting everything in their mouth. to Arlene Bloom's work. She has, uh, and I'll talk about this later, but she has um, a website called greensciencepolicy.org, I believe. She also updates a list of manufacturers that are um, no longer making flame retardant chemical couches. Um, so there are great resources for that kind of thing, um, just to let people know that 